Okay. Welcome everyone to our Luxembourg lecture today with Anna M. Agatangeglu. The title is Radical Queer and Global Black Anti-Capitalist Abolition. And my name is Katharina Pühl. I'm working at the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation at the Institute for Social Analysis. And together with Inga Newton, we will host this lecture today. This is a cooperation of Rosa Luxemburg Foundation and the section of politics and gender at the German Association for Political Science, as well as the working group of politics and gender at the Institute for Political Science, uh, University of Marburg in Germany, which Inga represents here today. Anna in Toronto, Canada joins us via Zoom. She will speak for about 40 minutes After that, we will have a Q&A session for about half an hour. You can join in by asking questions in German or English already during the lecture via chat on Facebook, YouTube or the website of Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, which my colleague Daniela Müller, which you can't see here in, uh, on the screen, will collect and pass on to us. I'm now handing over to Inga. Hello and also welcome from my side as a spokesperson for the section of politics and gender of the German Association for Political Science. I'm very pleased that we have the opportunity to hear Anna Agasangelu in a digital lecture today. We originally invited her as a keynote speaker for our conference Queer Resistance, Anti-Capitalism and Global Economies, which unfortunately had to be cancelled due to the corona pandemic. We had invited Anna to Marburg because of her work uh, where she connects the lines of queer feminist, anti-capitalist and decolonial perspectives. As Anna will also argue in her lecture today, the connection of these perspectives provides an important resource for responding to current, current crises uh, to create solidarity, to fight for another future. I hope that her lect lecture will inspire us Uh, in this sense today. Uh, thank you, Anna, for accepting our invitation again. I'm really looking forward uh, to your presentation. And now I hand over to Katerina again, uh, who will introduce you shortly. Anna M. Agathangelou teaches at York University, Toronto, Canada, in the Department of Politics. She was a fellow in the program of Science, Technology and Society at the School of Government in Harvard, 2014 to 15 where she developed her project Found in Translation, Cosmopolis, the Value of Biotech and Racial Capitalism. Her publications have appeared in various journals like Gender and Politics, Soma Technics, Radical History Review, International Studies Quarterly, Millennium, Globalizations and International Journal of Feminist Politics. She co-authored with Kyle D. Killian a book titled Time, Temporality and Violence in International Relations, Defetalizing the Present, Forging Radical Alternatives from 2016. She co-edited with Nevat Sojuk, Sojuk, Arab Revolutions and World Transformations in 2013, as well as with L.H.M. Ling, Transforming World Politics from Empire to Multiple Words, from 2009, and she is author of Global Political Economy of Sex, Desire, Violence and Insecurity in Mediterranean Nation States, published in 2004. So let's start, Anna. The floor is yours. The floor is yours.
go on. Okay, now we have a sound. It's not perfect. Um, sorry to all listeners. Doesn't. Yeah, but yeah. wait a second. Sagt uns, wenn sie weitersprechen soll, dann sagen wir ihr das. Can you start a new, Anna? Sorry for the problem. Please start from scratch, please. No, it's not. Uh, no. Nein? Yeah. No. 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 Oh, okay, Anna. There seems to be a larger problem. We cannot hear you. Um, can I? I'll do it now. So we can hear you, but uh, the the sound is not going out. You know, to the people. That's the problem. Ich schalte mal kurz so ein Zeichen in die Kamera, auch wenn es unprofessionell ist, weil niemand den Leuten sagt, dass man uns nicht ja. hört. Ach so. <lacht> Aber weil... I'm really sorry, Anna. Um
Yeah? Okay. Hello, so we apologize for the uh, sound problems. We try to fix it creatively, so uh, we hope it will be fine. The sound might be not that perfect, but uh, we will try it anyway, like this now. So I hand over to Anna now. Um, hello, thanks everybody, and uh, sorry for keeping you waiting. Uh, in this presentation, I plan to speak to three major questions. The question of social reproduction and its entanglement with debates about life, ongoing struggles in movements of queers and blacks and their disjunctures and connections, and then possibilities for thinking about decolonization and abolition, especially with the Black Lives Matter and other uh, struggles worldwide. Um, before I start with the social reproduction and its entanglement with debates about life, I would like to share a map with you on COVID-19. Yes. Can people see it? Okay, so uh, this map above shows COVID-19 is concentrated in the three uh, world poles and dominates the capitalist world system, East Asia, Western Europe, and North Africa. More specifically, a correlation seems to appear between the pandemic and the intensity of flows and mobilities in world metropolises. Um, it has changed dramatically. Of course, as you all know already, COVID-19 has changed dramatically the way we work, travel, go to schools, basically the way we live life. Some of us have been confined to our homes and others remained on the front lines taking care of those whom global racial capitalism has been systematically and structurally obliterating. And of course here, as we all know worldwide, I mean, we have seen the numbers, a lot of the uh, people that have been impacted the most by this have been uh, black populations, Latinos, and, and, um, and mostly immigrants. While some may say that this is a pandemic and has nothing to do with structural violence, I argue that this structural obliteration of life cannot be understood outside the frameworks of global racial capitalism and its entanglements with enslavement, colonization, and social reproduction. Um, okay. I'm going to stop sharing. Um, reaching back to movements that have kept the struggle going, including Cedric Robinson's Black Marxism, rather than drawing on more recent high profile accounts of neoliberal capitalism to help us understand uh, you know, what is going on right now with COVID-19, as well as other structural uh, obliterations and expropriations. Um, reaching to queer movements for freedom and liberation or identity politics allows us to pose the question of the structural obliteration of life and the possibility of the abolition or the end of the world or global racial capitalism as we are as we know it first i ask what the struggle movements that make life their side of contestation as well as frameworks of racial capitalism offer us that many liberal and even more critical and widely read accounts do not. And of course, some of those accounts, I mean, they're well known, I mean, Harvey, Wendy Brown. Second, I ask what Black Lives Matter and queer movements offer us when enunciating racial capitalism, the ongoing obliteration of life and the end of the world. In order to answer these questions, I first provide some insight from Cedric Robinson, showing how his theorization of global racial capitalism allows us to think the, the end of the world or abolition with the possibility for what Fanon calls the real leap for a planetary otherwise and thriving. Robinson uh, coined the term racial capitalism in black Marxism, the making of the black the radical tradition in 83. And some of you may know this is a side point. He couldn't even find a professor to supervise his dissertation. Uh, the committee actually resigned. In, in this book, he critiques the political order and the authority of leadership, thus anticipating the political currents in contemporary movements such as Black Lives Matter. Movement, he tells us, 
a movement organized horizontally rather than vertically. Challenging Marx's notion of class and its application universally, he argues black rebellions are expressions of a black radical tradition. Uh, and for him, of course, radical tradition means that, you know, the lived temporal experiences of people's lives uh, inform and shape how they are going to take on the struggle and really challenge the structure. For him, this movement's objectives and aspirations confound Western analytics, especially radical ones that fail to grapple with the racialism of capitalism and its general history. So what does Robinson mean by racial capitalism, you may ask? Drawing on the work of Oliver Cox, uh, Robinson challenges the Marxist idea that capitalism was a revolutionary negation of feudalism, a temporal logic that became significant in the way we read and understand the global reproduction of life itself. Rather, capitalism emerges within the feudal order and thrives in Europe, which is itself infused with racialism. So from the start, I mean, Robinson, I mean, tells us that, you know, cannot, we can never think of capitalism without racialism. A lot of people see this as a secondary or part of the, what we call superstructure, but Robinson says that's not the case. Kelly comments, Capitalism and racism, in other words, did not break from the old order, but rather evolved from it to produce a modern world system of racial capitalism, dependent on slavery, violence, imperialism, and genocide. Capitalism was racial, not because of some conspiracy to divide workers or justify slavery and dispossession, but because racialism had already permeated Western feudal society. The first European proletarians were racial subjects, Irish, Jews, Romans, Gypsies, Slavs, etc. And they were victims of dispossession, enclosures, as we all know it, colonialism and slavery within Europe itself. And, and of course, uh, one uh, side point that I want to bring here, um, many times when we think about the Black Atlantic, we tend to forget that um, Europe was involved in the Black Atlantic, but simultaneously, Europe was also involved through the Middle East from the uh, uh, Black slaves that came in the Middle East through the, uh, the Arab raids. And um, the, the Black Atlantic slavery was 10 million uh, slaves uh, through the Americans, but through, uh, Europe, I mean, through the Middle East was 7 million. So that's a pretty substantive number as well. And this is something that we really need to take seriously when we're thinking about Europe and enslavement. Robinson's work refuses to let us imagine, let alone understand, the emergence and possibility of work capitalism without the racialization within Europe and the colonial processes, such as enclosures, invasion, settlement, expropriation, and racial hierarchizations worldwide. And I emphasize settlement here because um, a lot of the debates now in, around indigeneity and settlement tends to ignore that there were indigenous people in the in the what we know as the uh, MENA region in the Middle East and also in Europe itself. So when we think about settlement, we have to also start to think analytically on that register as well. European nationalism and the emergence of the state structure have been bound up with racialist fictions. For instance, the ideology of Herrenbog or the governance by an ethnic majority of different populations, Robinson tells us, drove German colonization of Central Europe and Slavic territories, explained the inevitability and the naturalness of the domination of some Europeans by other Europeans. Acknowledging the racialism of capitalism allows us thus to recognize that the tendency of European civilization through capitalism was thus not to homogenize, but from the beginning to differentiate, divide, segregate, expropriate, to exaggerate regional, subcultural, and dialectical differences into racial ones simultaneously. That racism is, from the beginning, a, a structuring logic of capitalism, and capitalism cannot be thought outside it. While these ideas are not new, the moment and political urgency that confronts us today pushes us to enunciate and deeply engage with racial capitalism. 
A focus on it requires greater attention to the essential processes that shape the modern world, such as colonization, primitive accumulation, enslavement, and imperialism. And of course, we cannot imagine the emergence and bolstering of uh, uh, racial capitalism without the twin pillars of enslavement and colonization. And of course, colonization here, I mean both settler colonization and colonization of uh, different uh, lands. McKintrick reminds us that the geographic management of blackness, race, and racial difference, and thus non-blackness, hinges on a long-standing but an acknowledged plantation past. And the plantation here is very important because, for instance, I come from Cyprus, uh, the first experiments with plantations began in the 1300s in Cyprus around uh, um, sugar, you know, and Cyprus was one place in the going from the Middle East to uh, uh, Europe. Um, so uh, and, uh, acknowledging that global racial capitalism structuring processes are enslavement, colonization, primitive accumulation and imperialism also pushes us to place contemporary forms of racial inequality and, and inequities, and I emphasize inequities here because inequality has been taken very much by liberal narratives, you know, in a materialist framework. Dominant historical narratives of racism locate their origins in European colonization tend to really uh, erase the fact that capitalism and, uh, and racialism are from the beginning entangled. Robinson challenges the notion by documenting their prior roots in Europe and their logics of racialization as opposed to difference or ethnic relations. And I want to emphasize that because ethnicity tends to sanitize racialism and it tends to really uh, not account for the material aspects of racialism there. He points to how these ideas were systemically used to organize and order both life and capitalist relations on a global register. And of course, we can never overlook the fact that racialism and military technologies enable enslavement and colonization, though through conquest and domination, though conquest and domination were not always the sole motives. The elaborate systems of thought that constructed indigenous people, for instance, as less than fully human, was entirely necessary for the colonial project. Um, enslavement and, and the construction of anti-blackness and the enclosure of lands into plantations were entangled with industrial capitalism. Racialism has been and is deployed to facilitate maximum accumulation. At certain moments, it can even exceed the desires of various fractions of capital. Consider the overt racism of the contemporary extreme right movements in Poland, Greece, Germany, and the US, which are arguably counter to the desires of much of multicultural corporate global capitalism. But I, I want to say here that we cannot really um, imagine and really get this uh, uh, alternative right as outside the global racial capitalism. They are entangled and they are doing some other aspects of capital as well. Uh, this unevenness of racism to capitalism, though, does not mean that two are not entangled. Rather, it means that we may need materially to trace the connection of value formation and the production of difference simultaneously. Silvia Federici, for instance, points to an important materialist relation, that of primitive accumulations and the ways that producing difference and value are interlinked. In my own work, along with Michelle Ahmed, we extend this to show that primitive accumulation sorts uh, blacks as things of no value and the rest as possible objects to be integrated for expropriation. So primitive accumulation itself or racial capital, racialized uh, capitalism allows for this division to be happening even with primitive accumulation. For us, focusing on the global racial production of value and values is not just an exercise. It allows us to understand how a question, in this case, the question of life itself, is conceptualized, articulated, and understood, thereby shaping political strategies of racial capitalism, but also of movements of movements. Let's, for instance, take the notion of a racialized group, Arab immigrants in Europe or Turks in Germany, 
or a sexualized group, queers, and the question of marriage. Focusing on these racialized and sexualized groups as, as marginalized and, and push for their rights while important, it misses how racial capitalism and its globality are assembled and explained away on a material sense and toward accumulation and the production of value and property. And here, property as theft for elites worldwide. The work of capitalist accumulation and primitive accumulation cannot be done without the active production of racialism. Here, I'm not just speaking about identity politics, but racialism as a structural, organizing, and ordering principle of capitalism that tells us who can be producers, who have value, and who can be expropriated and even obliterated when no longer necessary. And in this um, in sense, we have seen this happening, how in a way the obliterate, I mean, COVID-19 has become an obliteration machine. And, you know, remembering the Membi here, we can think also of necropolitics. There are many examples, but some bring home the violence and terror upon which racial capitalism depends, with divisions, human and otherwise, doing its working, workings. Primitive lands versus modern lands, developed Europe versus underdeveloped colonies, lazy blacks versus hard white workers, etc. I would like to take a few minutes to speak about capitalism primary pillars, as I already said, colonization, settler colonialism, and enslavement. It is important for us to understand many of our most radical theorizations do little to show that the creation of the viability of this imperial system and its globality depended on these processes of accumulation. And these were not external, as Robinson already said. It is through these given circumstances that capitalism makes what Karl Marx calls the fatal leap between logics and history. Primitive accumulation is a formal moment that shows us the birth of the form of the labor commodity but it also is the segregation and externalization of certain life in the form of nature, women as biological birth givers, nature for productive relations, and that we can act upon it, other lands for colonization. I mean, Maria Mies has done a wonderful work explaining this as a labor commodity. Capital sets itself in motion and discovers planetary realm, realm or globality precisely through the emergence of the labor power commodity, but a commodity whose violent and brutal birth was the hallmark of modernity. Let me make a quick diversion. This production of externalization does not mean that capitalism produces life, because it does not, even though it sells constantly this fiction. It rather helps us understand how the nation state at its emergence is a world racial capitalist state. The world itself or racial capitalism cannot do itself without the nation state. The world itself as the world of capital is worldly, a product of the nation form. It's of a kind of trace effect of the process of enslavement, colonization and capture. It is also a kind of a trace effect of the process of social reproduction and what takes place. Capitalism does not create life, but always posit that it does, simply as a self-evident and available living labor capacity in its most contemporary sense. As many theories have argued, the primary concern of capitalist innovation today is not discovering new ways of increasing the stock of fixed capital for the next cycle, which it, it does, but transforming the creative capacity and private cultivation of the qualitative dimensions of life into labor power. So what is this thing that is produced in life, this thing that founds the continual motion of capitalist accumulation and on which this motion depends for its very condition of existence? Together with Andre Lord and Franz Fanon, I argue those energies, natural and otherwise, and I always put natural in quotes here because natural is something produced and constructed as such in um, under racial, uh, racial capitalism that are put to work to reprocess life practices and form them into sequences that cannot be appropriated by capital 
even when the state attempts to appropriate this life to the greatest extent possible, organizing and concretizing the maintenance, the care, and I put care in quotes here and scare, uh, scare quotes here as well, of this industry, industry ag again in scare quotes, by means of the investment in life. The state here is the hand that is able to operate because capital cannot appropriate the total circumstances of the reproduction of life. The nation state invests in a vast array of forms designed to quote unquote care for and shelter certain life to ensure the consistent and constant supply of lands, nature, labor power, which can be captured and commodified. Simultaneously, we have seen the state to want to do this work as cheaply as possible. And more recently, uh, doing it through the killing of people. So a lot of the, um, um, you know, uh, the killing of blacks have much to do with this as well. And of course, global racial capitalism is in a delirium. As the Lewis and Gattari say, there are no delir deliriums that do not involve history before they involve some ridiculous figure of mommy and daddy. With these notions, we can also think of ideas like the national familism or capital cyclically recurring fetish for home and hearth as key techniques in the reproduction of labor and labor power. And here, I mean, money and daddy can also be, uh, for some of us, not metaphors, but really uh, pointing and orienting us to questions like land. And of course, uh, land is always the mommy, and then daddy is always capital and then capital can act on land. And I don't have time to discuss that, but we can have another conversation. Now I'm going to speak to you about um, the ongoing struggles of queers and blacks and their disjunctions and convergences for the possibilities of the colonial struggles. And I, as you can see, I make a transition here from the mommy and daddy or notions of family notions of you know nature you know and of course nature here uh, uh, questions of sexuality again who is sleeping with whom in order to produce you know and procreate uh, to have children and um, what is at stake here of course is the reproduction of actual life capitalism always posits that it reproduces life but it never does and i repro um, and i repeat this again because it's really important and in a sense, the only way the current racial capitalist system can understand this reproduction, even with this move to invest in newer technologies, IVF, etc., is by positing queerness as an oppositional material difference to blackness through anti-blackness. And when I say material difference, I mean that blacks cannot produce value. They cannot even register, actually, on the, reg on the valuation regime of value. It does so through what Foucault calls biopower. Walker explains biopower is the investment of life into governance and it's a sequence of operations, functions, and intensities which delegates into various existing spaces the control and calibration of the smooth functioning of domination. Uh, this occurs not strictly through dispossession, oppression, and so forth, but rather through the formation of investments, the direction of desires and affective sensibilities, the deployment and management of operations of identification and comfort. That is, biopower can be distinguished pre precisely by its tendency of insinuation, its effect of managing its own outside by conceiving of and deploying assemblages capable of regulating even those things which are strictly speaking not ready at hand for it. So queerness here, for instance, has become a, the newer side for the investments by the state in and even redirections of desires to be integrated into this uh, nation state form and basically racial capitalism. It invests in the factory, again, scare codes of making life for some at the expense of others. And this factor, uh, factory tends to be this, uh, the factory tends to be the side of family as well. So as we have seen a lot with uh, neoliberalism, there has been the, the sale of, you know, queer families, uh, queer um, possibility of, of generating families. 
you know, and and so there is this kind of viable power investment. Um, this is a remember part of rational logics and grammars, codes and genres of rationalism and capitalism. That is how, how capitalism is able to accumulate more profits and sustain in place poverty relations and the theft that uh, continues to um, uh, to bolster them. Puyanas is supposedly integrated into the notion of family and homeland through notions of investment and promises of freedom. Here, the notion of family and homeland are understood via the colony, of course, and via always anti-blackness. Historically, empire posited its own end in the form of the queer, the figure heralding its end without the reproduction, there is no empire. Uh, yet, at the same time, and precisely by deploying this figure as its limit, the empire strengths strengthens itself, ensuring the stability of its power and continually expanding and encompassing new elements. Um, Russian capitalism points any kind of difference as the impossible side of power, wherein that which restrains and displays the empire's end also at the same time serves as, a, as the source of its possible reproduction and expansion. The potency contained within queerness, and I put potency on purpose here, um, as an actual life is an energy derived from the power generated in every act of capture and integration. So in a way, capitalism, racial capitalism, depends on this difference in order to um, you know, continue its new assemblage, uh, uh, its assemblages anew. And, and sells this notion of integration as, as a form of uh, responding to the desires of freedom. However, this capture does not provide the freedom and the non-violence and non-terror that Russian capitalism promises. It, it actually cannot do that, because if it did that, it, it can no longer be racial capitalism. Rather, capitalism draws on queerness as a form of raw energy to undermine itself long enough by relying on that which lies outside it, queerness in this particular case, and at the same time enable uh, itself by this undermining because without an externalization, an outside development, expansion, or obliteration, in short, what capitalism understands as its possibility would be impossible. Andre Lord reminds us uh, capitalism always creates these particulars in order to enslave them and conquer them in different, at different moments. Racial capitalism always functions as a continuity in this continuity. Therefore, the world of particular identities or instituted perspectives like queerness in this particular case more recently or value in a global schema of valuation and their temporal position can never be a tool for radical politics. This schematic is capital's own blueprint for its expansion as a continuity in this continuity. Thus, queerness in the hands of racial capitalism and its contingent imperial gender orders turns into the instituted perspective into the energy that can produce, quote unquote, labor power towards the production of, of surplus value. So now we can uh, use queerness as a new side of sale, as a new side of production, uh, of production of value. And this can happen both in terms of industries, but also it can happen in terms of materially trying to use uh, queerness as an energy towards production relations. However, this life is granted only in opposition to blacks whose lives cannot even register. That Silva argues that value is equated with determinancy or the form which is applied to matter, content, so or the, the, what she calls the materia prima. In the modern Western imagination, and I quote here, blackness has no value, it is nothing. As such, it marks an opposition that signals a negation which does not refer to contradiction. For blackness refers to matter as the thing, it refers to that without form. It functions as a nullification of the whole, signifying order that sustains value in both its economic and ethical sense. And I close quotes here. This is the Silva. This op opposition is problematic as it ignores the blackness and queerness as structures of power 
coexist in ways that could systematically rupture these dominant segregations, determinations, and orderings of racial capitalism. These are positionalities and lives that intergenerationally, as a project, not the project of where capitalism and racial capitalism have been interrupting the naturalization of both procreative and social reproduction. As long as queerness becomes instituted and naturalized as a site of value formation um, and in opposition to blackness as non-value, registering as nothing, um, then uh, through the use of anti-blackness terror, then there is no possibility for solidarity. There is rather an ongoing investment in necropolitical governance structures and a complicity in, with capitalism, which capitalism calls care regimes, for example, the killing of peoples because they are blacks and as such do not have any value in the structures of racial capitalism. And of course, this is a mythology that evades all the work and life that goes into the making and ongoing existence of racial capitalism regimes. In addition, even in the integration of queers in its structures, the, the state does not redress the violence and terror these people experience through homophobia and transgenderism, daily sexual surveillances to fit into the normative gender orders of quote unquote social reproduction and what I call really death. Capitalism does not resolve the question of sexual terror that is at stake, but it displaces it into other bodies, zones, and lives, always inverting them. Gump says, sometimes we kill each, each other off into irrelevance for the So we have to apologize again. There is a sound problem. There will be a short interruption, five minutes. We hope we can fix this again. I'm really, really sorry. Um, yeah, we try to fix this. Yeah, stay with us, we hope.
going to speak about possibilities for thinking about decolonization and abolition. Okay, we don't, we, it's not on the... She sh should just go okay, on. Okay, you just go on, we just pause, we can also have a discussion. No discussion, no, sie ist im on. Okay, you are, you are on, uh, you are on, so uh, we try to get your voice on the live stream. So the people can only hear you, they cannot hear me. Okay, so now I can start. Yeah, but maybe not with your talk, with something like test or uh, hey, hey test. there. Okay, test. Hello, hello. Cyprus. Okay, now I had a... Okay, it's working. Okay, it's working, it's working. So. Okay, perfect. So, so wait a minute. So, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. So our, our proposal would be that you restart with the, the last section you got okay. into. Okay. Uh, uh, when you when you switch to Audio Lord and her um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. So as I said before, I will start with possibilities for thinking about decolonization and abolition. Okay. Yeah. But wait, wait. There is. We have to wait another minute or um, just give me a sign. Ah, so I thought you were talking in the background. Ah, uh, okay. So um, yes. I you on. On. now, we, now Anna, we switch you on. Wait for like start after five seconds or something. We switch you on now. Okay. Start. Okay. Uh, now I am going to talk about possibilities for thinking about decolonization and abolition. I will start with a poem from Audre Lorde, um, from Litany for Survivor. For those uh, of us who live at the shoreline, standing upon the coast and edges of decision, crucial and alone, for those of us who cannot indulge the passing dreams of choice, who love in doorways coming and going, in the hours between dawns, looking inward and outward, at once before and after, seeking a now that can breed futures like bread in our children's mouths, so their dreams would not reflect the death of ours. I, I chose to begin um, this section with a poem from Lord uh, because Lord was basically pointing to the connections between queerness and blackness. For her, she never saw these movements and struggles as separated, and she saw them as uh, basically part to challenge the death of the racial capitalism. Then I want to bring another point about uh, Audre Lorde in, from her book, uh, Cancer Journals, where she was talking about reconstruction. And then for her, the, and, and the reason I'm bringing that is because a lot of what we have seen with COVID-19, who are the, how did the structure respond? How did the state respond to some people and not others? How quickly it didn't respond? Uh, so Lord, uh, she was going through cancer um, uh, reconstruction, and then she she said um, that she used the phrase the fantasy of reconstruction, and I, I'm using reconstruction purposefully here. Whether the system itself can be reconstructed to refer to surgery to replace a, a lost breath alludes historically to the national failure of post-civil war reconstruction, a time when, as Jim Downs has argued, African Americans were exposed to more illnesses and physically threatening circumstances than ever before in the nation's history, and during which a newly defined population of dependents was created, dependents in quotes here, was created against the category of black workers. The Freedmen's Bureau utilized the category of able-bodied to recruit men for agricultural labor and to reject from the labor population single freed women, elderly, disabled, and or famed former slaves. So um, Lord's allusion to the question of, of reconstruction here highlights how, in a way, racial capitalism always depends on the exclusion and segregations of different uh, peoples. And going back to the question of determinancy that I gave you before, there is this fantasy of um, determinacy equals value. So anybody that doesn't fit into that um, figuration is seen as a problem and excluded. 
Uh, this historical allusion grounds Lord's argument about her contemporary experience as a black body under the care of a white dominated medical industry. Uh, no sound again. Is there sound or no? Is there sound? Um, is there is there a sound? Leute? Ich höre sie nicht. Ich höre sie, also ich habe hier einen verzögerten Stream, ich höre sie nicht. Anna, can you hear me? But I cannot yeah. hear you. Oh, yeah, now I can hear you. Okay, is okay. there sound? Can I continue? Um, könnt ihr mir sagen, ob Sound ist bei euch? Habt ihr Sound? Ähm, das ist ja. ein bisschen unerläutig, wir haben vielleicht einen Sound zu viel. Ja. Ah, okay. Uh, I'm so, so sorry. Das uh, Sound ist da. They can hear us. Uh, so you can continue. Okay. This historical allusion grounds Lord's argument about her contemporary experience as a black body under the care of a white dominated medical industry in a history of medical models designed to reconstruct and rehabilitate that have actively and aggressively prevented cohesive community for women, blacks, and people with disabilities and undermine social changes and access to the resources that might benefit and allow healthy lives for those groups in favor of hegemonic ideas about communal or national health and devalue the worth and autonomy of those bodies marked female, dependent, queer, and non-able body. Um, I drew on that and uh, the work that people have done on that in order to show that similarly contemporary ideologies of medical reconstruction as we are seeing with COVID-19 and rehabilitation do similar work by putting those who might gain access to such knowledge under surveillance with the aim of preventing their attempts at shared knowledge creation in terms of health and um, what health looks like. This is reflected in the practices of the hospitals, uh, in the practices of the state, some of the uh, medical sites, but also some of the lack of infrastructures for particular populations. Um, I'm not going into depth here, but it may be really good for you at some point to, you know, when she's talking about um, the uh, not accepting the prosthetic when she had cancer uh, as a threat to uh, basically to evade and, and um, make invisible the very wound uh, which she needs to treat, the very wound that was created by racial capitalism. Okay, uh, Lord survives these pressures by inhabiting and articulate, articulating her awareness of an already racially disgender space. She not only chooses to wear her cancer, as the Diana Price Herdel suggests, but she also wears her blackness, queerness, sickness, as, and this gender female identity legibly when the world is asking her to hide it because of its threat to the normative racialized, genders, uh, racialized structures of gender that would otherwise work to render black women powerless. The Black Lives Matter is at the forefront of challenging pro creative and social reproduction. For its members, thinking through the ongoing terror and death of black lives, as well as the movement to eradicate surplus labor power by imprisoning black bodies or letting them die, uh, black lives have been challenging that what we know as social reproduction and procreative pro reproduction is at the forefront of the problem. Pauline Gumbs has drawn extensively on the works of Lord and other black feminists and poets to speak about the relations of black maternity and what she calls queer intergenerational, intergenerationality as, as different, or not different, but rather as rupturing um, enunciation points of what we understand as procreative and social reproduction. Um, and for her, um, this challenged the primacy of procreation and social reproduction as Russian capitalism assembles them with terror and violence. For her, this to offer a rival model of production, interrupting, in quotes now, a development timeline with the possibility for a radically transformed society that their respective cover stories would beg us forget. 
drawing extensively on the dismantling of the welfare state, she argues that the black mother who is demonized and criminalized can be seen as she who refuses to reproduce poverty and is busy teaching us something else. She who refuses to reproduce the status quo threatens to produce a radically different world and thus the ongoing violence upon her body. And, and we have seen that systematically, both in terms of Black Lives Matter, killing um, blacks on a daily basis, and really trying to eradicate a, basically a project that challenges the project of uh, racial capitalism. And, really, and, and here I don't want to really say just because I am black, I immediately do that. But I, I want to argue that the struggles of blackness to challenge the violence and to understand this racial capitalism is what makes those lived experiences crucial for enunciating uh, movements uh, for challenging this, uh, the, these structures. Andre Lord's idea of shoreline comes tell us, points to the ways black female sexuality and reproductivity, the reproduction of slave status, the reproduction of a culture of poverty, the theft of lives and bodies for enslavement should be untangled. Through the inter and generation, she argues that the gender and racialized orders of racial capitalism can be challenged with the possibility of co-producing a, um, a, differ, a different conditions that black women and queers can actually generate desire, speech, narrative, predict, and social relationship. A production silenced by the reproduction of these desires as pathologies in the hegemonic epistemologies. Um, I, and I quote here from Gams, the action of, uh, of generating is actually the primary definition of the term generation, but generating in this case directly reflects the heteronormativity latent in the root genre, which signifies gender as naturalized difference in time, in type and appropriates generation into the reproduction of that difference through a primary association with human procreation and classification, the ideological engi engines for both gender and race. The second definition of generation is synonymous with production, as in John Clark's passage in Rohalt's Natural Philosophy, the production of something which before was not, we call generation. Um, in interstices, Spielers explains the predicament of black women as follows. Their enslavement relegated them to the marketplace of the flesh, an act of commodification so thoroughgoing that the daughters labor even now under the outcome. Spiller's intergenerative move is not merely the production of a daughter subjectivity. She invokes intergenerationality to denaturalize the work of the reproductive work of the marketplaces to dehumanize black and queer uh, women and women as well. For the work of blackness, and I quote Da Silva here, as a category of difference fits the Hegelian movement, but has no emancipatory power because it functions as a signifier of violence, which when deployed successfully, justifies the otherwise unacceptable, such as the deaths of black persons due to state violence in the US and in Europe, and worldwide, actually in Africa as well, and capitalist expropriation in Africa. That is, the category of blackness serves the ordered universe of determinacy and the violence and violations it authorizes. A guide to thinking, a method for studying an unbounded sociality. There are implications for both scholars and activists for social solidarity. In terms of activism, we need to change how we view the state and our relationship to it. The state is already entangled with racial capitalism. It's entangled with anti-queerness. Far too often, the state is seen as an ally or neutral force. Indeed, even when people lose faith in the state, they often still turn to it because there is no other apparent alternative. Many radical movements have been co-opted, for instance. Um, we know with queer movements like the marriage um, of queers and become too implicated in the state itself. What is needed is to begin seeing the state as, as a site of contestation that must be confronted in a manner similar to industry. 
This suggests a two-pronged struggle against both corporations and the state, which will certainly not be easy. For researchers, our task is not only to develop a research agenda that recognizes the degree to which racism and violence in the alternative right, in the militarization of our society, deaths, policing, and imprisoning are a function of racial capitalism and also linked to the needs of vulnerable communities. And, and also the lack of infrastructures to allow for the conditions of creating worlds otherwise. Racial capitalism cannot be solved by a research agenda that reaffirms the boundaries and frameworks established by capitalism itself. Indeed, we should help expose the ways the state participates in these projects, how it has sought to cope queers and, and, and other communities, uh, many migrant communities, its support of Russian capitalism and its willingness to forsake its marginalized communities. Together, we can generate new strategies to rebuild a movement that truly works towards abolition or the end of capitalism as we know it. And I know some people, uh, do not necessarily or associate abolition with the, uh, with the United States. But hopefully, based on how I presented it here, abolition means basically the overthrow, the dismantling of racial capital, capitalism. And I'm going to finish with a poem that um, Audre Lord wrote, uh, wrote, which is called Dreams Fight, uh, which provides a dystopic challenge to Martin Luther King Jr. famous I have a dream speech. Whereas King refers to seeing the stone mountain in Georgia surrounded by happy black and white descendants holding hands, Lord describes the people of winter, this is her poem, putting off their masks to stain the earth red with blood and the people of sun are carving their own children into monuments of war. In this moment, after the hope of civil rights, Lord prophesies the violence of white liberals who use civil rights as a political mask and black people trapped in the doomed reproduction of inanet, inanet adequate struggle. Instead of reproducing the legends and legacies of you know, a left um, movements or civil rights movements, Dream by asks for a non-reproductive alternative that rejects inheritance and resists the transubstantiation of death into heritage. In part two of the poem, Lord Streamer prophesizes, when I am absolute at once with black earth, fire, I make my now and power is spoken, peace, address, and hungry means never or alone. I shall love again when I am obsolete. That's it. Thank you. Thank you for your talk and lecture and input to us. Um, many questions and fruits for thought, I think. So we are looking now if there are reactions from the audience, you can join in and ask questions via the chat um, or comment on thesis which um, um, were put to the agenda of a left, radical, queer, anti-capitalist political and social movement. <coughs> So we, so we might wait f for two or three minutes. There you have the chance to uh, write down your questions. Uh, I think due to the, well, I'm really, really sorry for that, but due to the um, technical problems, you might have a lot of questions maybe concerning the understanding of some of the arguments Anna made. So don't hesitate to ask uh, even um, like basic questions. Start with one question. <coughs> so, 
So there is there's one first question. Uh, Anna, there uh, it's a question asking why is uh, there an interest for Russian capitalism? So I don't know uh, if you can relate to that question. Why is there an interest in Russian capitalism? Yeah. 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 Uh, I'm not clear about the question, but I th is this where there is an interest in me or in general? I don't know. Um, so I just have one sentence for the question. The, the person who uh, um, wrote the question, can you elaborate more on that? There is no further explanation to the question. I will maybe pass to Katharina uh, for another question. Yes, Anna, you were talking uh, um, in the end of your talk about the lack of infrastructures to create worlds otherwise. What might these infrastructures be like if they are not uh, raised to the bottom or to death, as you? explicated um, yeah, strongly. So what would be a practice otherwise? And infrastructures ex especially are a key word in concepts of critique of um, extracting care, um, extracting whatever kind of um, um, power from people. So can you say more about that? Okay, so thank you, uh, thank you so much for the question. I uh, maybe I can link it a little bit to the previous question of racial capitalism, in the sense that um, when we are thinking about possibilities, uh, I think first the important issue here that we know historically how capitalism has worked is by constructing difference and constructing the difference always in opposition. So in a way. Um, um, let's say indigenous people were excluded or were seen as savages. All the while, I mean, those people were already producing, you know, um, labor power or the, their lands were the sites upon which uh, industrial capitalism could expand itself uh, worldwide in the way we know it. Um, but in, in that sense, we have to understand first that the workings of capitalism. So for me, just talking about capitalism only erases the fact that capitalism constantly, you know, um, produces difference, but, but it doesn't produce difference only as an identity. It produces difference through the value formation structure. So uh, once we can understand this and these the divisions and segregations, then we can start really uh, thinking about possible sites where we can contest that, but also simultaneously don't take for granted some of the institutions, um, like the state, for instance, that it will provide for us. It will give us social provisioning. At uh, the moment that we know that the state does not necessarily work for social provisioning, it will do that long enough to continue racial capitalism. So for me, when we're thinking about um, uh, possibilities and building up uh, solidarity and also thinking about care, and I put care here in codes, in scare codes, because uh, care is all already understood only through procreative social reproduction. And thereby, if somebody is not seen as socially reproducing, they are not going to be tended to, or they are marginalized in such a way they are not deserving. So that's why, I mean, we're seeing a lot of uh, black people criminalized and imprisoned they can produce labor in prison, but they cannot be seen as legitimate um, uh, subjects of value for, uh, formation in the formal structures of capitalism. It doesn't mean they are not producing, you know? So understanding these workings of racial capitalism allows us to really uh, imagine and and also work together in ways that were not viable before. So one of the major divisions also, of course, is nation state. Many of us imagine that the nation state is the container through which we can do our movements. And, and that's not really viable. Russian capitalism uses that, localizes 
it's working, but it's always at the forefront uh, global, it's planetary. So thank you, Anna. And now we got some other questions from the audience. Uh, I will start with one question concerning our role as social scholars. Um, the question is, what are some examples uh, that you could share with us of scholar, activist, academic productions in solidarity with uh, political struggles, not against them or exploiting them um, yeah, for our careers? Okay. Um, I, I, this is like uh, some of uh, you that know me already know where my position is. I, I don't see that the university is a separate institution from the rest of the, uh, from the rest of the struggles. For me, I see it as a site of production of struggle. But simultaneously, I don't also see, like for instance, let's say Rosa Luxemburg, you know, foundation, and not producing research. It produces research. I do um, a lot of work in Africa. A lot of our African partners there. I mean, we are not working. Uh, the academics are over here, and the partners are over there. We are all working with. Um, with a vision of how we want uh, the world to be, how we want the society to be. So for me, I think while I know that there is a lot of, um, you know, appropriation happening uh, because of these uh, divisions of difference that I already um, uh, spoke about, but also not just um, uh, differences. Differences are also asymmetrically hierarchized. So you can say the academic is the one that produces knowledge production, whereas people in the movement are there to learn from the academics. But that is not uh, uh, the way that uh, Robinson or other um, you know, people that I cited, Audre Lorde, will challenge these ideas, that we are all um, working towards a vision and producing imaginations that can allow us for this world and the planetary otherwise and thriving. So dividing people and really arguing that, um, uh, you know, we are better intellectuals or we know more because we are in uh, in certain states, it's, it's a problematic, you know. So uh, ethically for me, I think academics, but also social movements, we are accountable to each other about the world that we want to produce and be part of. So uh, that's that's the question. What is the vision that we are imagining of the world that we want to be part of? So uh, you know, those people in, you know, let's say in Africa or my mother, you know, just because my mother is not in academia, didn't go to school, that doesn't mean that my mother is not a producer of struggle or a producer of vision about the world she wants to be part of. So for me, I think that's really crucial for us to start thinking that these divisions themselves are productions of racial capitalism. And we have to really challenge them in, in, in the places where we find ourselves, but also in ways that are not expected because we are also complicit in it. We also want to professionalize. We also want to really say, I am the expert in the civil society and I can go and, and collect the stories of these people in these marginalized communities in order to go and, and um, you know, make certain claims for them. But then the question is, are you making claims for these people or are you also participating in building a vision that can be shared collectively? That's a very different conversation. Are you building up your professionalism or are you participating in a vision that um, some people are not going to be killed in the making of, of yourself or your professionalization. Okay, come here. Yeah. Okay, so thank you, Anna, for that. There are several other questions from the audience. I may uh, give you two and then you answer both of them. So, uh, because two short questions. One is, uh, could you elaborate uh, to what extent we can also speak of gendered capitalism? I guess you can. And the, the next question is concerning uh, a phrase you, uh, you cited from Lord, uh, about the fantasy that 
determines uh, equal value. And the question was, could you say a bit more about this phrase? And okay. yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I cannot see you, uh, whoever is asking the questions, and I wish I knew the names as well. You know, so um, in terms of gender capitalism, I thought I did talk about that. I mean, I didn't go extensively because I didn't have a lot of time to really, you know, elaborate on that. But um, I, I wanted to bring race, uh, racial capitalism at the forefront because in a lot of ways, um, um, I think there is an issue around enslavement that we haven't really thought systematically. That there is something about, uh, you know, the notion that um, uh, uh, the existence of a slave allows for the mobilization, ongoing mobilization of people against um, uh, blackness or black peoples because they are afraid themselves to be slaves. So we have seen that with white movements, you know, or white working class, even though they know that, um, you know, this uh, structure um, is always against them, they will be mobilized because of this investment in white supremacy. So in a way, white supremacy is already gendered anyway. When we speak about, um, uh, you know, social reproduction or procreation, we are already assuming that only, let's say, white um, um, subjects or white women uh, are the appropriate subjects for the creation of a normative gender order. You know, and black women themselves or uh, migrants or, you know, uh, Latinos, they, they are a problem. They are, uh, they are uh, basically diluting or polluting the gender and normative proper order. So in that sense, I think um, uh, racial capitalism is from the beginning also gendered because there is an imagination about what can make capitalism possible. And what can make capitalism possible is through the values of white supremacy that uh, white women are going to be the, the, uh, um, the biological breeders in, in quotes here. Uh, for the structures of racial capitalism. So we know, I mean, and there is a lot uh, writing on that. Uh, and again, I don't want just because I'm speaking about race, because this goes against my framework. Speaking about race, I forget um, uh, gender because at the moment I speak about um, procreation and social reproduction and predicting that, I am predicting the gender normative orders that capitalism articulates for us. Um, yeah. So, and simultaneously, I'm, I'm thinking about intergenerational possibilities of, of imagining uh, relationships and what some people have called the commons. Uh, then the question, if I understand, Inga, is like a value equals determinacy? Yes. Yes. Okay, so what I mean with that is that there is a notion of the subject that can really produce value. So that subject in, in a Kantian sense or even Hegelian sense is the, the subject that is a, a self-determined subject. So that self-determined subject is comes to be um, uh, not collated but equalized with value. So anybody who is not uh, already understood through white uh, supremacy as um, uh, not self-determined, basically anybody who is not uh, part, um, you know, a part of the, you know, the European kind of understanding uh, is excluded, you know, and, and, and in that sense, that's what I mean with determinacy plus value. So subjects like black subjects and uh, slaves, basically slaves already as producing a certain kind of value cannot legitimately be seen uh, as um, self-determined subjects, even though they still produce value for capitalism. You know, because there is a hierarchization, a symmetrical hierarchization here about valuation, um, uh, positionalities and existence. Yeah. Maybe you want to make a short remark actually to a difficult uh, encompassing question. You're addressing uh, poetry or poetics um, systematically in your work 
And of course, that's not to be understood as simply uh, another way to tell the story. But it's a very material, materialized way of changing um, how we see the world, how we experience the world, how we experience relations, interrelatedness on a global level. So it's not about to tell a different story simply, but with regard to the desire to change material conditions of living and uh, living conditions and futures. So if you want to say a few sentences about that, it's kind of a method, but it's also kind of a different way of engaging materialist analysis of capitalism on the other hand, as I understood it. And maybe you will leave us with some foods for thought uh, with yeah. regard to this kind of uh, perspective. Um, uh, that's exactly correct, uh, Katarina. Thanks for that question. I mean, I, I had a, I finished with a poem in order to really um, gesture towards that, but not uh, as you said as a way of telling the story in another way. Okay, but it's it's a vantage point. It's an enunciation from the position of peoples that have been systematically excluded in a material sense, both in terms of how they are positioned in this value formation. Uh, they are seen more as not even forms, not even as, um, you know, um, having the capacity basically to produce, you know, value, but also uh, things that can be acted upon. Uh, things that, you know, we can do things with, you know, so that's uh, one of the things for me, poem, challenges this division of content and form so in a material sense from the beginning we are seeing everybody else as being um a, like even in a marxist sense the part of the superstructure the idea we are seeing something that is external to the basis the material basis of production of both value and ideas and language so for me i see poetry as basically rupturing that temporal uh, sequencing that comes with um, uh, systems of thought, dominant systems of thought, Western systems of thought, that tells us that we can always think in, in a sequential sense, linear sense. And you know, it, even in a cyclical sense, without really accounting for the language that people bring to the table. And the language that people bring to the table is not just a voice that we hear, but it's a material life that speaks and orients us to their um, um, lived experiences, temporalities, but also, you know, ongoing struggles that these people have been part of. So for me, I see the, the poetry as basically, in some ways, untimely, that, that ruptures, you know, sequences, uh, material notions of form and content, and, and also kind of, um, problematizes uh, structures that are already in place and demand of us that the only way we can struggle and be part of the struggle is by being integrated in, in, in what are considered formal and always easily read readable struggles. Because, and, and this in a way for me, um, I would like to um, I think that uh, as Audre Lorde, her poem reminding us of the untimely temporality of dreams, that people have visions and dreams about how they want the world to be. Um, and maybe sometimes it's not anthologized or published, but it's, it's, a, it's a living, what I call living archives, that they are telling us how people are dreaming and understanding uh, their own visions of the world. So yeah, poetry for me speaks to that. And it's also ethical. It's also um, uh, really points to the fact that um, um, ethics is not just about uh, a distribution of some resources, but it's also about distribution of life. How do we relate to each other? How do we tend to each other? How do we um, uh, generationally take care of each other uh, allows for um, a, a different, not a different, but a vision that ruptures the vision that is given to us through um, racial capitalism. Uh, yeah, and and I will say I, I am always reminded of my uh, 
a grandfather that used to say, just sit and make time. So in a way for me, poetry is sitting and making time uh, around the visions that um, we are interested, the dreams that we have um, and yeah, and keep alive. So there's one more question we will take. Yeah, yeah. So thank you, Anna. There's one last question from the audience. I don't. I just uh, also want to give the chance if you can answer this one. It's about the concept of power. It's a quite. It's a question. Is power producing or constructing difference, or does it use already available differences? The question is: Could you? Uh, elaborate on, on that, on the concept of power you're using. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so in, in that sense, I want to say that, you know, rational capitalism changes daily. You know, so, I mean, there is, like what I said, co uh, continuity and discontinuity. So uh, it, it changes, but simultaneously it, it throws on some of existing uh, you know, productions of difference that were made at particular moments, but it also um, articulates new ones. You know, so, uh, and what I call in the bear in this paper, but I didn't have a lot of time, it also displaces difference. So it, it allows itself, it, that's why I use this concept of delirium, because in some ways uh, it takes in. It tells us at one moment that let's say queers cannot be uh, as figures cannot be part of the economy of valuation process. At another moment, it changes that and says yes, they can be part of that. But again, what it doesn't tell us is that it never really challenges the material sexual violence and what I call terror violence at the forefront of creating the structure. So now it displaces that violence elsewhere. So in that sense, I mean, it, um, it, it both uh, produces, but draws on existing differences to make possible this structure. Yeah, and um, in, a, in a way, these differences are not always, I mean, for instance, we can go back and then look at some of the um, uh, very fascistic movement, movements that are emerging in Europe now, a lot of them are going to like 1300, you know, and talking about purity and, you know, um, they have these notions of Aryanism, you know, and they can draw on literature. I mean, we know, for instance, in Germany, some of the literature was drawn from, uh, you know, Indian um, Sanskrit. Okay, so some of this, um, existing material i mean capitalism makes uses of it all the time how it assembles this though is very important and that's where we need to really and where the ruptures are in that assemblage is very important for us it's not just the production of difference it's not just the use but also where the cracks are in trying to make um uh, those um uh, distributions of difference where possible. And this response also to Katrina's question previously is in those cracks that we can start imagining those, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, demolitions of monuments that are already in existence, that we can see some breathing space, that we can start uh, thinking there is possibility of other imaginations, you know, that some of them were there already, they never went away, but some of them we have to produce ourselves anew as well, mm -hmm. you know? Okay, Anna, thank you so much so far to this point, this evening. The discussion will go okay. on. We are happy that we at least managed to get some of your ideas. I hope that our audience was able to get something out of this too. We would try to, um, yeah, to, to produce a, a version which you can see on the internet uh, after this lecture. And I say thank you to you, Anna, very thank much, you so, so much. For, sharing your, for sharing your thoughts and presenting us ideas, uh, food, uh, foods for thought, as one says. And thank you, Inga, for this collaboration also. And we will go on asking critical questions. Thank you. Thank you. you, thank you sir. Okay. And thank you for everyone in the room who helped us in this technically not easy situation, ladies. Thank you. <laughs> uh,
thank you to all of you and thanks to the audience as well for their questions i wish i could see you but i couldn't and uh, you know till uh, later see you later somewhere thanks thanks Katarina and Inga. have a nice thank day you. thank you bye thank you